Hello everyone and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This will be the first episode in a series of retrosynthesis practice episodes that I'll be doing, and each one hopefully will be focused on a specific reaction or a specific group of reactions that we will learn throughout this course. I will always have an easy reaction, a medium one, and a hard or difficult reaction for different levels of students of organic chemistry. So if you're interested in a specific difficulty of reaction or retrosynthesis, those timestamps for each reaction will be marked in the description and also in the video timeline. For this video, we will be focusing on nucleophilic substitution reactions. So if you'd like to review your nucleophilic substitutions or your different mechanisms by which they proceed, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and also take a look at some of the videos I've uploaded on those topics. Okay, so let's get right into it. This is our easy or novice reaction that we'll be looking at here. We will be designing a retrosynthesis to form acetonitrile here, starting with methane, just CH4. And with each of these reactions, I will ask you to pause the video and try to design a synthetic pathway for yourself before you go on and look at the one that I have provided. So please pause the video now and then resume when you have tried the problem for yourself. So how are we going to pursue this? Well, we know that with our final product, acetonitrile, there is a cyano group, so a CN group, and from nucleophilic substitutions, you should be able to recognize that CN minus is a very good nucleophile. So we can use that fact in our retrosynthesis. A lot of times in retrosynthetic analysis, a very good strategy to use is by going backwards, so it's retrosynthesis where retro means reverse or backwards. So let's work backwards from our product, acetonitrile. Like I said, we know that CN- minus is a good nucleophile in nucleophilic substitution reactions, so we could imagine reacting some electrophile, so a haloalkane with a good leaving group, to form our acetonitrile. So our starting haloalkane will be our electrophile, could be, for example, methyl bromide. So we know that bromide is a good leaving group, and if we substitute that bromide for cyanide, that will give us our acetonitrile product. So how are we going to accomplish this? Starting from methyl bromide, we need to perform an SN2 mechanism, because remember, methyl haloalkanes only proceed through SN2 reactions, not SN1. So we need a good nucleophile, that would be something like sodium cyanide. So in the laboratory, remember we always need a salt, we can't just have CN- minus without anything else. So we use something like sodium cyanide. And the solvent for this reaction could be something like DMSO, so dimethyl sulfoxide. That's a pretty good polar aprotic solvent that will promote our SN2 mechanism. And that will give us the acetonitrile product. And that's our first step in retrosynthetic analysis. Now we're closer to our starting material, so how can we convert our starting material, methane, to this haloalkane methyl bromide? Well, we know that alkanes are notoriously unreactive, so CH4 is not really going to participate in that many reactions in organic chemistry. One of the few reactions that alkanes undergo, if you remember, is radical halogenation. So we know that we start with CH4, and we need to end up with CH3Br, so just substituting one of those hydrogens for a halide. And the way we can do that is by using radical halogenation. So we can treat our methane with bromine, so Br2, and then we need ultraviolet light, so we can write H nu. Ultraviolet light initiates that radical process, by breaking the bromine-bromine bond and starting that radical halogenation. And if we limit the amount of bromine that's in our reaction, we can ensure that the halogenation will only happen once. So it will give us just the monobrominated product instead of dibromomethane or tribromomethane. So now we've completed successfully our retrosynthetic analysis for methane going to acetonitrile. Next up is our medium or intermediate reaction. This will be the production of 
R2-methylbutyronitrile from R2-bromobutane. And hopefully these videos will also get you accustomed to nomenclature and getting used to those names of organic molecules just in passing. So please pause the video now to attempt the problem on your own before resuming and going on to the guided solution that I will give. And what you can notice from both of these molecules is that we have retained the stereochemistry. So both this CN group and the bromide group are both pointing towards us. They're coming out of the page. So we need to find some way to retain that stereochemistry. Another thing you could note, just like the previous reaction, is that we have CN here. So cyanide, again, is a very good nucleophile, and we can use that to our advantage. So the first thing you might try is reacting, maybe starting with this bromobutane here, and just using our sodium cyanide as a good nucleophile. And maybe we could use a solvent like DMF, so NN-dimethylformamide is also another good polar aprotic solvent. So because we have a good nucleophile and a polar aprotic solvent, even though we're on a secondary haloalkane, this will still proceed through mostly SN2 kinetics. So we're making sure it's going to go through SN2 and not an SN1 mechanism because of our good nucleophile and relatively unhindered substrate and the solvent. However, if you remember your SN2 stereochemistry, you'll know that it undergoes Walden inversion, so inversion of stereochemistry at that stereocenter, which will give us this cyanide group, so the CN group, but it will be pointing into the page. So we've actually inverted the stereochemistry, which is not what we want. So we'll have to think of another process to obtain our product. Okay, so this is a good trick to be able to know. And that trick is using two consecutive SN2 reactions to accomplish this retention of stereochemistry. So what we can do is, starting with the bromobutane, we could use an intermediate nucleophile as sort of a stand-in for our SN2 reaction. So what we can do is use maybe sodium iodide. So we know that iodide is a good nucleophile in SN2 reactions. And again, let's just stick with DMF as our polar aprotic solvent. This will give an inversion of stereochemistry here. So the iodine will be pointing into the page with that dashed bond. This will be an SN2 reaction, just like the previous one. And then it's pretty straightforward to figure out the last step. So we can just use, again, sodium cyanide, again in DMF, to form our butyronitrile product. So with that cyano group, now we have inversion of stereochemistry a second time, but where we've inverted the inverted stereochemistry. So overall, we've retained the same stereochemistry as the starting material. So using two SN2 reactions consecutively is a good technique to be able to retain the enantiomerically pure starting material. Finally, let's look at our harder reaction here. And this will be, our product will be tetrahydrofuran, or commonly THF, and we'll be producing that from this molecule here, 1,4-dibromobutane. Again, please take a couple minutes and try to solve this for yourself. So pause the video and then come back when you are ready. The first thing that's very useful to look at in retrosynthetic analysis is how many carbons you have. So we can count the carbons in each of our starting material and product, and notice that they both have four carbons. So we don't need to add or subtract any carbons, which is a good sign for us. We're just messing with the functional groups. Another thing that is common in retrosynthetic analysis is a ring closing reaction. So again, we're starting with an acyclic compound, so that's our dibromobutane, and our final product will be cyclic, so we're going to be closing a ring at some point in the reaction sequence. So for me, I think the most straightforward way to approach this problem is by working backwards. So what could our last step be to produce this THF product, this five-membered ring with an oxygen in it? 
Well, let's look at maybe a ring closing reaction that could happen. We know that we're starting with a halo alkane, so maybe this could be also an SN2 reaction because we know that those bromines on the starting material are going to be good leaving groups. So is there any way we can incorporate that oxygen into our ring? Well, if we're looking for SN2-like reactions, we know that O-, so the alkoxide anion, is a very good nucleophile for SN2 reactions. And if you have an unhindered substrate, so maybe a primary haloalkane, that's going to proceed through SN2 kinetics very well, and it's not going to have very many elimination byproducts or anything like that. So what if we use O- as our nucleophile in this process, and we also have bromine as our leaving group? So what we can draw is maybe this variation of the starting material, where we have bromine, and then we have our butane skeleton, and then we have O- on the other side here. So we've somehow replaced bromine with O-, but we'll take a look at how we do that in a second. And if we have this intermediate, we know that since the O- is a good nucleophile, and bromine is a good leaving group, this will easily proceed through an intramolecular SN2 process. So intramolecular meaning two functional groups reacting on the same molecule. So we know that if we make this intermediate, this will proceed quickly through, like I said, an intramolecular SN2 reaction, or this is also called an intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis, so using an alkoxide anion and also some sort of SN2 reaction to make an ether. In this case, we're making a cyclic ether with that O in the ring. Okay, so another way to approach retrosynthetic analysis is to work from both the reverse direction and the forward direction and then meet those two processes in the middle. So we can also do that in this reaction here. We figured out the last step as a pretty straightforward last step of the reaction. And what could be our first step? We know that we need to somehow convert bromine into an O- functional group on our starting material. And O- is pretty close to OH. So we could think of replacing one of these bromines with a hydroxyl group. And again, we know that OH is a strong nucleophile in SN2 reactions. And since we have a primary substrate, this will go through an SN2 reaction pretty well, pretty cleanly, without any elimination byproducts. So to replace just one of these bromines with OH, we can treat our starting material, the dibromobutane, with NaOH and we'll specify that we're only treating it with one equivalent of NaOH. So we only want to substitute one of those bromines and not both of them for the hydroxyl group. And if we use a solvent like DMSO again, so dimethyl sulfoxide, that polar aproteic solvent, that will pretty cleanly proceed through an SN2 mechanism. And that will yield us with this difunctionalized compound. So we have a bromine, so a haloalkane on one carbon, and then an alcohol functional group on the other side of the molecule. So that's great, now we have our alcohol and our bromine. And the last step we need to figure out is how to produce the O- anion from the OH. So there are several ways to do this, but one of the ways you could do is by throwing some sodium metal into this alcohol. And what sodium metal does is reduce the H+, to hydrogen gas. So what happens is that sodium will take off the H plus from a couple of these alcohol molecules. It will give off hydrogen gas in the process. And what we end up with is the alkoxide anion. So that will bring us to our last step, which we've already figured out. So this will be our retrosynthetic analysis for this kind of expert reaction. If you've noticed, even though this video was about nucleophilic substitutions in general, I never used an SN1 reaction in any of the retrosynthetic analyses, and that should be very telling to you. And the reason is that SN1 reactions are not actually very useful in organic synthesis. So why is that? Well, if you're comfortable with your SN1 kinetics and the properties of SN1 reactions, 
You should remember that SN1 reactions always generate racemic mixtures of products. So we don't get any enantioselective reactions with SN1 reactions, whereas with SN2 reactions, they will always invert the stereochemistry. So if you're looking for an enantiomerically pure product, and you have to throw away half of your product in order to just get that one enantiomer, that is an incredible waste of money and waste of time where you could use an SN2 reaction or a different reaction to make that cheaper and more efficient. Another reason is that SN1 reactions are often accompanied by E1 elimination products. While it's easier to limit the amount of E2 products when you're working with SN2 reactions, it's very difficult to limit the elimination byproducts when you have an SN1 pathway. So for that reason, you would have to throw away even more of your product if any of it followed the elimination pathway rather than the substitution. Sometimes SN1 mechanisms are unavoidable in organic synthesis, but most of the time we try to look for a more efficient and a, more, a cleaner pathway instead of an SN1 process. So I hope this video made you more comfortable with retrosynthetic analyses and designing syntheses using nucleophilic substitution reactions. If you enjoyed this video, or if you learned anything, please like and subscribe to my channel. Also, like my page on Facebook at Total Organic Chemistry. And as always, if you are able, please consider donating to my Patreon page, which I will link in the description. Thanks for watching.